Thank you very much for this uh, kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I don't have pictures with Pierre because I realize that 90% of my interactions with him was on committees. And they don't take pictures of committees usually. <laughs> but of course, everything that was said here for the last two days is of course true and shines through when someone like Pierre is in a committee. And whenever, you know, he would intervene or say something, which was not that often, it would always raise the level of the discussion. And uh, so it was a pleasure to have to work with someone like that. So now comes the neutrino part of the multi-messenger. And uh, it's very simple. This is my outline, February 23, 1987, August 17, 2017, and September 22, 2017. So I'm going to explain what happened on these dates. Of course, most of you know what happened on, in 87. There was a supernova in Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, three experiments observed 24 neutrinos. And uh, thousands of papers were written. And what's interesting is that most of these papers said something relevant. It was incredible what we learned from this one multi-messenger event. So multi-messenger astronomy is not new for neutrinos. Uh, in fact, if this event happened now, uh, hopefully it would be a supernova that's in our own galaxy, not in the LMC, in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Experiment like Super K, instead of 24, would see many thousand events from 10 kiloparsec, typically four, five thousand. Ice Cube would make a movie with a million events of uh, the time dependence and the energy dependence of, of the supernova. It would be incredible, the information compared to that. So, but we're just waiting. We just make sure we are on all the time. Uh, the subject of looking for neutrinos from the cosmos was always a multi-messenger exercise because that's the way I usually introduce this talk or any other, neutrino astronomy. Uh, astronomy has been extremely successful at doing astronomy at different wavelengths from radio to microwave background, optical x-rays, gamma rays, but uh, you run out of luck around 10 to 100 TV. And uh, you run out of luck because from astronomical distances, say this is an active galaxy, suppose it emits gamma rays, we're sure it does, uh, those gamma rays don't make it here. There are 410 microwave photons per cubic centimeter in the same universe as the extragalactic cosmic rays, and uh, they will interact somewhere on the way and uh, produce an electron-positron pair and then they become charged particles, and with charged particles you cannot do astronomy, as is well known from the case of protons. That's why after 105 years you can summarize this subject as we don't know where they come from and we don't know how they are accelerated. However, we know that the universe is not empty because we see cosmic rays that go, have energies all the way to 100 million TeV. And so that means roughly that 20% of the universe we have never seen. And the only way to do astronomy there is to use neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos are the ideal messengers. That idea is as old as the existence of the neutrino. Nobody invented that. It's obvious. They are electrically neutral. They are massless in this stock. They are unabsorbed by anything, so they are pretty much like photons and slightly better. Uh, but interesting for this talk, they track nuclear processes. And the argument for this experiment was very much to, to find the source of the cosmic rays. And of course, 
neutrinos come from decay of pi on scale on charm, and uh, to produce these objects, you need a proton beam. You cannot produce them uh, in any other way, with photons or electrons. The problem, of course, is that uh, they are difficult to detect. But uh, it's a problem that uh, you know, we thought was worth the effort. Uh, if you, for the particle physicists in the audience, if you want to, to accelerate the cosmic rays with LHC magnets, you have to fill the orbit of Mercury. <laughs> that tells you the challenge. So don't you want to find out when you're a particle physicist how this is done and where it happens? So uh, Ice Cube, uh, after a long effort trying to figure out how big a detector you need, nothing I told you tells you how big a detector you need, uh, this, the speculation started with Berezinski and uh, Zatzepin in, already in 69. They wrote the first paper that mentioned the word kilometer cube detector. And so after a lot of effort by many theorists over many decades since then, uh, the agreement was that you had to build at least a kilometer cube detector. And the way this was done was uh, to put 5,160 10-inch photomultipliers, so like a basketball, and you just put them one and a half kilometers deep in the ice under the South Pole. So after, uh, if you go one and a half kilometers from the surface, you will find this kilometer cube block of transparent ice equipped with photomultipliers. Uh, then it's a Cherenkov detector, so these are the photomultipliers. It's a Cherenkov detector, and here you see a muon going through the detector, a cosmic ray muon, and you see the Cherenkov light emitted, and you see the sensors picking up the Cherenkov light. Uh, the size of the blobs is proportional to the number of photoelectrons detected, and you see, you can see the direction of uh, this muon by eye. So this is what you're looking for. This is a real event. Uh, it's also cosmic ray muon. It reconstructs as 89 TeV uh, with an error of about 10%. And you see now red to blue, this muon comes through the Earth. And so that's a neutrino because nothing comes through the Earth. It's a muon created by something that interacted inside or under your detector. And you can reconstruct that these energies, everything lines up, so you not only detect a neutrino, you know where it comes from. So this is a real event. Uh, it comes from about, it, it, this one, from 11 degrees below the horizon. So you see it barely comes through the Earth. And it has an energy of about uh, 7 plus or minus 2 uh, PV. So this, uh, this uh, I can make this talk short. This event is almost 5 sigma by itself because it de deposits 2,600 TV inside the detector, measured. And so no background neutrino from the atmosphere can ever reach this energy. So uh, this is uh, a 4.6 sigma discovery with one event. So August 17, that was the event you heard about, uh, the LIGO Virgo discovery. This was our first opportunity after the supernova to do uh, multi-wavelength astronomy with neutrinos. The, this picture you rarely see, I'm sorry, I have no reference to on it, but what you're looking at are obviously in spiraling neutron stars. But what you're looking at is, uh, are the magnetic fields created in the system. And so what happens is when the neutron stars merge, you have an explosion, which is very much like a supernova, and it produces neutrinos like a supernova. The 87A neutrinos. 
But this event is 40 megaparsec away, so you can never see it. Unless this happens in our galaxy, we'll never see the MEV neutrinos. There will never be the equivalent of, uh, of the supernova observation. However, something interesting happens. After they spiral in, the material around the in-spiraling supernova for, form an accretion disk. And in the accretion disk, there is an inflow. And you saw the magnetic fields. There is a magnetic fields launch a jet perpendicular to the accretion disk. Uh, that's called the kilonova. There's extended emission. And in this jet, there are all kinds of opportunities, just like in any jet in high energy astrophysics, to uh, accelerate protons by shock waves and to produce neutrinos on the material. So did we see anything? Antares looked, we looked. Unfortunately, we saw nothing. The simplest explanation of this is that, uh, uh, as you can see on the figure, that we were looking away from the jet. It's one event. We don't know exactly what the collimation is, but it's very well possible that we didn't look in the right direction. Another possibility, however, is, and the data has not decided, this is a debate that's still going on, is that the jet, you know, the, the critical thing of, you saw a short gamma ray burst, and was predicted that those are merging neutron stars. However, that gamma ray burst is extremely weak. Like we have looked, I'll tell you later, at more than a thousand gamma ray bursts. We never looked at anything this week. So one other speculation is that uh, the jet doesn't get out of the material. It's choked and it stops and it's still, and of course you don't see it in gamma rays or you barely see it, but it will produce neutrinos. And so it would be interesting in this kind of model to keep looking uh, for the, to, to look in the future where we actually can see neutrino events from uh, mergers that actually don't uh, uh, emit gamma rays. You see from the picture, the calculation of the high energy neutrinos emitted is standard, uh, uh, a standard calculation. And as I said, it's important, uh, and we are actually trying to see if we can rule out this, this uh, second situation by the fact that we haven't seen neutrinos. Uh, that we haven't seen neutrinos, you can see on this picture, you see the Antares events, uh, the Ice Cube events, and you see the interesting thing, Auger can uh, detect neutrinos from horizontal air showers, so they see a tiny sliver on the sky, but the galaxy in the merger happened to be in that sliver, and they also didn't see neutrinos. Uh, should we have seen something? And I'll use this table. This, I don't want to go through all of this. Just look at the shaded uh, thing on, on the top. If this had been a regular kilonova, which it could have still can have been, and on axis, we would have seen something between uh, half and six events. This is the usual astrophysical error on your calculations. Uh, probably we would have seen it. The problem is it's the wrong hemisphere. And so we are a factor five less sensitive in the southern hemisphere than in the northern hemisphere. So we, the, the most optimistic prediction is half an event, and so we didn't see anything. Uh, but in the future, we should, an, on, uh, an event in the direction on, on axis, or a kilonova event with a shock jet, we should see if it happens in the right hemisphere for us. Of course, uh, as you all know, APC and many others are building a detector in the Mediterranean that will solve uh, this problem. So what about September 22? That you may never have heard of. 
In fact, uh, what happened September 22 is the following. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the ice cube results. It's not really part of this talk, but to appreciate. I have already told you how we see neutrinos from the northern hemisphere, from the South Pole. You see them coming through the Earth. But we have another technique, which is less powerful, but still looks at the southern hemisphere, where we look for a neutrino interacting inside the detector. This is what Super K called contained events. There's nothing dramatic about this. And of course, contained events, uh, you guarantee that there's nothing coming in the detector. So this is, uh, on the left, you see an electron neutrino making an electromagnetic shower. And uh, there, of course, we are sensitive to the whole sky. Uh, we have, by now, with these two methods, collected some hundreds of events. These hundreds of events come totally uniformly from the sky. So the first surprise was, and certainly to me and should be to everybody, I think, we don't see the source of cosmic rays in our own galaxy. We actually see extragalactic cosmic rays. There's no evidence that reaches the three sigma level, uh, although there are some hints. There clearly must be some component from the galaxy, but we haven't found it at the three sigma level. Uh, you see here the two methods. You see the flux for upgoing neutrinos. That's the, the pink or whatever color that is banned. And the black points are the contained events. They perfectly agree. They have a power of e to the minus 2.1. And uh, there is an interesting question for multi-messenger astronomy. In this case, multi-messenger astronomy is guaranteed because, you know, what does a cosmic accelerator look like? It has some collapsed object, some black hole that, whose gravity powers the accelerator. But these things are surrounded by dust, by light, and... Uh, so that gives you the opportunity to produce, uh, to produce neutrinos. Just like at CERN, you shoot a beam in a target and neutrinos come out at the, the other side. But if you produce uh, charged pions that decay into neutrinos, you inevitably produce pi zeros that decay in gamma rays. So for that six, seven, 1,000 TV neutrino, there should be a corresponding gamma ray. Such a gamma ray you can see with an air shower detector. Nobody has ever seen something like that. So what's the answer to this puzzle? It's very simple. I told you that gamma rays from faraway objects don't get here, but that's not the end of the story. You see, you produce an E plus, E minus, they radiate further, they produce a cascade in the microwave background. And uh, so you start with a PV photon on the left, and out comes, by the time you reach Earth, many GV to TV photons when you reach that Earth. It's just the energy has been subdivided. So now that's where you can come in as a theorist. This is uh, an early version of our ice cube data, and it doesn't matter. So the black line is e to the minus 2.15, just drawn through the data. And it doesn't matter whether you put a cutoff or not. So now you, you know that there is a similar equal uh, gamma ray flux from pi zeros. But that flux cascades in the microwave background but that's simple QED, I can calculate that. And where does it come out? It comes out as a red line. And that's the flux of extragalactic photons seen by the Fermi satellite. So this is by far the most interesting result. Uh, many people have played with this conclusion. But what you conclude from this is that the energy density of neutrinos in the non-thermal universe is similar to that in gamma rays. This certainly came as a surprise 
because all astronomy, with few exceptions, was done with electrons and gamma, and gamma rays. So that's out of the question now. So neutrinos and, by implication, protons play a very important role in the non-thermal universe. However, unlike Ice Cube, we have looked through this uniform map for all possible sources of... Uh, I could stand here until tomorrow morning, tell you how we have studied... the ways we have studied this map. But unlike us, the Fermi people know where their photons come from, and they actually come from blazars. These are um, active galaxies, supermassive black holes, drives a jet, it's a bit like the Kilonova story, and in the, in the jet you can accelerate protons that interact with gamma rays radiated from the disk, for instance, and make pions. Uh, these models can explain the data, but... Uh, uh, so the question is, are these the sources of the neutrinos? And we don't know. We couldn't prove that. In fact, we published limits on this idea that uh, after the fact or contained assumptions that were very questionable. So, but uh, to solve the problem, uh, clearly, as the theory and the data analysis didn't deliver the answer, we tried a different way. And that was a, to set up a system that when we see a high-energy neutrino, we reconstruct it within less than a minute and send an astronomical telegram to all the telescopes and ask to look in the, that direction of the sky. And uh, we send these limits about uh, uh, at the rate of one every two months or so. We are very conservative, uh, only to send interesting uh, possibilities. You see a, a neutrino here was our first. Uh, we had actually no idea whether, whether every, anyone ever looked. And so, in fact, we had been uh, doing this for quite a while. We looked at every gamma ray burst. Of course, we have been doing it in reverse. We looked at every gamma ray burst whenever there was an alert from the optical telescopes, uh, or, or any other telescope, gamma ray telescopes mostly, and then looked whether there was a neutrino in that direction and at that time. And that's, again, a measurement without background. Uh, if we saw one neutrino, it would be a discovery. Uh, we have looked at 1,300 something by now, never seen anything. But for instance, for the short gamma ray burst, they could be of the kilonova type. And it's unlikely that astronomers actually sent telegrams for those. They sent telegrams for the spectacular things in photons which are not the right ones for us. So this doesn't exclude, actually, gamma ray bursts uh, as sources of cosmic rays. But this is what happened on September 22nd. We sent this telegram. Uh, it was a neutrino with an energy of 300 TV that was detected just below the horizon, like the two you saw already. And uh, here it is. Within 40 seconds, the coordinates went, were sent out. We then took four hours to do a better reconstruction, but the two agreed, so that was not critical. And then uh, it was discovered that uh, within actually 0 0.06 degree, Fermi discovered not just a blazar, but a blazar that was flaring. These uh, supermassive black holes produce these jets and uh, in uh, short to long time scales. In fact, they produce uh, these jets on time scales of all time. There is no pref preferred time scale as far as we know. And so the, you see the Fermi blazar and the two reconstructions. And uh, that could happen accidentally, one in uh, 10,000 10, times. That's the probability of this. Uh, we had sent four alerts of this type and 10 alerts in total. So 
So this is at a three sigma level. However, then it was discovered uh, by magic that this blazar was actually a TeV emitter. They detected the source. And uh, we now know uh, that, uh, I'll come back to that, that uh, it must be a TeV emitter given its distance. And so that is rare, but you know, we don't really know how to calculate the probability. But so here you have already three sigma plus an improbable thing. And uh, additionally, this was actually a blazar. So this was, uh, the jet in this case was actually pointing at, uh, at Earth. Uh, this is magic. I like this picture, it was during construction. It are two 17 meter mirrors that use the atmosphere to detect photons. These are beautiful experiments. Uh, this is the sequence, I will not go through that. And uh, we didn't know, but it turns out that some 15 telescopes had actually followed up the telegram. Some only after the, f the match, the, the Fermi blazar was discovered, the flaring Fermi blazar. So I will not go through this. But uh, then subsequently, most of these telescopes were actually looking if they could see lines from the blazar to detect the redshift, and they couldn't. The emission was so strong that you couldn't see lines. Eventually, these uh, people succeeded, and it turns out that this blazar is at a redshift of uh, 0.33. Now, most blazars, nearby blazars, are at a redshift of 0.3 or so. Fermi, Magic, Hess, Veritas, they see these blazars, but the nearby ones are a factor 10 closer in redshift than this one. And it has a similar flux. So that means the flux of this blazar is actually 100 times bigger when it emitted this neutrino than your typical blazar in the sky. So this clearly points at some subclass, which we're, of course, not going to figure out from this one event. So from these public telegrams, you can figure out we, that uh, you, we identify the source. It's a very bright source. It has, a, because of its large redshift. And of course, because all these multiple measure, measurements by multiple telescopes, this one event for a theorist gives you more information than all the measurements in the past. So they're going to, this is going to really change our understanding of blazars. Uh, I will, how much time do I have? Uh, so, you know, it's hard to find a figure like this. In fact, I found it in 10 year old summer school lectures. I don't know who, who made it. Uh, but typically, this is a typical radiation from blazars. This is the energy emitted. And you see two peaks. This is not a flux, right? This is the, uh, the power of the accelerator. And you see there are two peaks. The first one is you accelerate an electron beam at a black hole. You did the Michirenkov radiation, and that produces the first peak. And then the second peak fits the by inverse Compton scattering, is fit at, uh, fits the second peak. So two simple mechanisms, and you explain the data. Uh, there, this slide actually speculates on pi zero decay photons, but where these two differ, there's no data. This is the MEV region, and we have very little information there. So this debate would have been go going on forever without uh, uh, neutrinos. So this is not the end of the story, and this is where I cannot tell you the end of the story, but you have already guessed. You suspect one source in the sky. Now, both Fermi and Ice Cube, uh, that's the beauty of these experiments. It was mentioned for gravitational waves. They, we have 
past 10 years of data, each of us. They're all there. So you can go and look back to your data. You don't have to do multi-messenger astronomy in real time. You can go back and look at this source, the past nine and a half years for us, although only seven years since the detector is complete, but 10 years of Fermi data. And so uh, you say, well, how can you find something you didn't see before? Well, that's easy to explain. Unfortunately, we have a rather good energy resolution for this high energy event. It's like 0.2 degrees. So that means even if you look at half the sky, you are looking at some 50 to 100,000 pixels in the sky. And each, pix each time you look, it's a trial factor. So it's practically impossible to detect anything unless someone tells you to go where to look. And of course, this was the opportunity to go and tell where to look and to look at your data without this enormous trial factor. And so you will have to wait to see what happened uh, because the papers are not are under, under review. But uh, I think uh, where statistics is concerned, <laughs> you know, we achieved something that was Rutherford. I always quote Rutherford, if statistics matters, do a better experiment. And that, that quote always bugged me. And here, this is a better experiment. Uh, you just get your evidence from a series of unlikely events that happen sequentially. Uh, so this blazer, of course, uh, was known for a while it's an interesting, uh, uh, what happens actually is that the flare builds up over a period of, of months. And then it becomes, when it peaks, it becomes highly variable. And that's when the neutrino was emitted. We know that it's highly variable from the studies of the Cherenkov telescopes. And... Uh, Highly variable means the typical day's variation. And so the question is, if you then look through the literature, there was actually previous evidence for this. Instead, Agile pu actually published a paper. They have a system where they detect flares automatically. And they detected this four sigma flare. There's no analysis involved. And they said, actually, they traced it that... Uh, to the fact that there was a flaring blazer two days before this happened. So possibly in the same category. Uh, these people, okay, this is the Agile paper. Uh, these people uh, actually pointed out that the highest energy event that Ice Cube ever observed, electron tau neutrino, not muon, uh, two TV event, was on top of a flaring of a flaring blazer with a month time scale, just like this. Unfortunately, I mean here uh, the chance probability is a, at the order of a percent. So this was not convincing, but in this context, what we've seen now, this may actually be relevant. So uh, time to conclude, uh, and the conclusion, my conclusion is that the future is now. So uh, we don't have to wait for the future. Uh, LIGO comes back on. We have to get an on-access skill on over. We have to get more of these events because, you know, this is a breakthrough, but not a discovery. It's like a, a police novel, right? You, we now have a tool to solve the cosmic ray problem, uh, but we haven't really found the criminal yet. So it may be, it may be that blazars is the answer, just like it is for, uh, for uh, in the case of photons, but it cannot be the complete answer because it clearly on this one event it looks like it's a subclass which we have not identified. Uh, the future is now, but uh, the, the real future is even brighter, I think. And in this field, uh, the future is determined by instrumentation. And uh, where neutrino detectors are concerned, of course, I have already referred to it. Uh, 
the, the advent of a detector in the Mediterranean, uh, possibly bigger than Ice Cube, is called, uh, going to be a very complementary instrument in many ways and will help. So we are all looking forward to KM3Net. Uh, Ice Cube is going to go to a gradual series of, uh, of uh, upgrades, which will eventually lead to a 10 times bigger detector. And we hope to start this. Uh, it looks like we are going to be able to start this in the next year or so. Uh, this is not totally uh, clear, but uh, I'm confident this will probably happen. So uh, there is a detector being built in Lake Baikal, which is smaller, but still has uh, the type of sensitivities where it can contribute. So for this to become astronomy, we need many telescopes and bigger telescopes. And that's what's really going to determine the future of this field. Thank you. Okay, thank you for still being here. <laughs> um, and I will try to talk about the future. I might need less lights in the front, thank you, because yeah, some of the gravity waves are hard to see as we heard about that earlier. So first, um, it's really a pleasure to remember this uh, brilliant man. He was a brilliant scientist, but he also, aside from scientific power, uh, vision, drive, perseverance, he was also an optimist, as I'll uh, mention in a couple of, of slides. So this is a picture I took of uh, Pierre when we were in his house. This is Pierre, my husband Sergio, Jim Cronin, and his wife Carol Cronin. Um, we had a really lovely dinner at his place, and that's when I took that picture in 2009. Uh, I knew Pierre uh, much earlier, uh, but the time I actually got to know him uh, more intensely was when he asked me to be president of a review committee that was uh, discussing the future of the U uh, UMR, je crois. I think that was the label at the time, but you know, it keeps moving. But it was around 2004, 2005. Uh, Daniele was part of that uh, wonderful group, and hopefully, um, his French was much better than mine, so I relied on him a lot. <laughs> but we had a lot of discussion in English uh, about, well, Pierre and I, uh, first, uh, who was funding what. Uh, so he gave me this kind of map of uh, the different entities involved in funding um, the future lab. Uh, it was already a virtual lab, so his idea was already uh, pretty much uh, gelled, but then it took a little longer by 2006 to actually have the EPIC really exist in a building. Uh, so before actually moving into the building, we had what we already saw earlier, the beautiful inauguration with uh, the great uh, tour of uh, the Louvre at night. Uh, this is definitely unforgettable, not only from the fact that we were just by ourselves in the Louvre, which is a very rare uh, thing, opportunity, but also by the people that were there. Um, and it's too bad that not everybody is with us still. Some of, of us are here, but not everybody. So uh, that beautiful uh, image was also sort of, you know, the end of a very long struggle. Not quite yet. The, the end would be coming actually in December of that um, year. So 2006, uh, APC was inaugurated, but they didn't really get to move in until December of that year. And I wanted to share with you this email that I found from, um, I, I wish I had found more things that were in my previous computer, but this is still in this uh, current computer, which um, is from December. So I'm telling, uh, so in the meantime, let me just keep this for a second. In the meantime, between May and uh, December of 2006, uh, I received, uh, urged by Pierre, uh, I applied for Anner Cher d'Excellence, uh, which we got, which was brilliant, and then we could I came to APC with my group, with postdocs, graduate students, and we had uh, new uh, colleagues that, and old colleagues at APC that were working uh, together. So I'm telling him that, you know, uh, I'm coming in the beginning of December to get started, because we had to start the INR grant in 2006. And he says, well, unfortunately, I'm in uh, Stanford, which that wasn't a big problem. Uh, do talk to Daniel uh, uh, Vigneault, because this, you know, this is his cell phone. Uh, maybe you, don't, you have the same cell phone. I should erase that so people won't call you. Um, and uh, 
we're now out of Collège de France, <laughs> but we're not yet in the new building, uh, strange that it seems, because the safety visit has been postponed until December 14. In fact, there is a restricted access to the building, half of the personnel in the morning and the other half in the afternoon. So depending on who you are, you could come either in the morning or in the afternoon. Uh, and this is uh, why I should be contacting Danielle. And, and given the situation, our administrative staff is now in Jussieu, so everybody is all over the map. Um, sorry for the welcome in these conditions. And then he ends with this lovely sentence. The comforting thought is that it can only get better. So this is his optimistic self. And uh, since we are supposed to talk about the future, I think there is a very bright future. And uh, I, I am an optimist too, so I definitely uh, engage very easily with um, Pierre's optimism about the future. So uh, let's share with him uh, that vision. Let me give you a um, hopefully um, concise version of some of the predictions for the future. This is a crystal ball, and the APC is central in that crystal ball. Um, APC and uh, the whole astroparticle endeavor has basically tripled astrophysics, right? So if you um, start in astronomy or astrophysics class and you explain how the photon spectrum ranges from radio to gamma ray, you get some, you know, many orders of magnitude. And for the public, we turn that into piano so that they understand, although not always very effective analogy. Uh, but in reality, the cosmic rays and neutrinos basically double uh, that range in energy. So we have a huge double the amount of energy that we can explore the universe with. And when you add the gravitational wave, which was another feature um, of the effort at APC, is another feature of the effort at APC that we heard today, you get yet another tripled, um, so you triple the energy, you get another uh, block of similar orders of magnitude, so you get really a huge uh, three times more energy uh, range to look into the universe than you started with, uh, with just a photon. So this is uh, really, uh, uh, you know, it will be uh, really unlikely that we don't learn a lot by having such a wider vision of there. Uh, so 2010, one of the questions in the very high energy particles uh, from space, so highest energy cosmic rays, was what are the sources of the highest energy cosmic rays? Well, a decade later, we are asking a similar question, but we have rephrased it slightly, uh, and that's really great news. So we had the suspicion that cosmic rays would be extragalactic. Now we have the proof that they are extragalactic. At least they are. So now the question in the 20s is what are the sources of the extragalactic cosmic rays? And that is due to the OJ dipole, which is above 8 eV. It's a 5.2 sigma anisotropy. We had a lot of work trying to get anisotropies uh, from cosmic rays and finally we got at the highest energy this uh, dipole, which is not pointing towards the galactic center. This is in galactic coordinates. And that is very much consistent with our idea that these uh, sources are extragalactic, which we had other reasons to believe, but it's really nice to have a direct measurement of that. This is the same dipole shown in equatorial, galactic, and supergalactic plane. Uh, it's very nice. I like the less plane the best. It seems to have a perpendicular dipole to, uh, with respect to the supergalactic plane, so that must be something interesting there, and I'm looking forward to reading papers that will explain why. I don't have an explanation right now, uh, but I'm pretty sure we can come up with a few. Hopefully one will be right. Uh, so other questions, as I just uh, we just heard from Francis, one of the uh, wonderful questions that came in the 10s and the 2010s is what are the sources of the ice cube neutrinos? And again, that I just had to rephrase. So this is one of the first um, events shown in their science paper of, uh, you know, published in 2013, but uh, covering 2010 to 2012. He can correct me as, uh, if I am not correct here. But um, the great news is that at least one of the sources seem to be uh, identified, maybe, maybe a whole class of sources, but maybe there will be more than one class of sources in this beautiful map, um, aside from a few background events. But uh, you know, this is really, I think, on the 20s will be a wonderful time to do uh, neutrino astronomy at the astrophysics neutrino level, so the PEV, and hopefully all the way to the EEV, as I'll be talking about a little bit too. So moving on to the EEV level, which is directly connected to cosmic rays is what is the flux of the cosmogenic neutrinos. So this is something that also changed in, in 2010s uh, because, you know, we had a few prejudices. We had the prejudice that cosmic rays would be extragalactic above the knee, uh, above the ankle, and we were right about that prejudice. 
We also had a prejudice, not all of us, but many, the majority, that most ultra-energy cosmic rays would be protons, and that was wrong. <laughs> so the neutrino flux associated with protons is still a, a very big question mark, and it will be very different depending on the composition of the ultra-energy cosmic rays. And finally, it would be really fun to have enough of these things around, uh, neutrinos and hadronic interaction events at the highest energies, to probe interactions above, you know, things that we can do in the laboratory today. So an order of magnitude or two, depending on what your primaries are. Or many more for the case of neutrinos. I'm thinking hadronic. Okay, so um, on the, the you know, ultra energy cosmic ray, we, know, we learned they are extragalactic, but we still don't know what the sources are. Uh, the way we go about them is through looking at the composition of cosmic rays. That is the easiest thing to measure, even that is a bit hard. Anisotropines in pointing, so anisotropies are starting to show up, uh, but pointing not yet in the cosmic ray uh, world. And multi-messengers, so that's where the neutrinos and in principle photons could help us. So this is a summarized cosmic ray spectrum, um, and you, you know that it's hadronically uh, dominated, protons and all other kinds of hadrons, uh, but then we have the electrons, positrons, antiprotons, uh, and now we even have antihelium, I'm told. Uh, so this is going to be a really interesting time in the low energy range, but as I'm given the task, and I also know more about the extreme energy range, we'll uh, focus on that. But just to give you a sense, uh, the, the different cosmic ray spectrum ranges, we have the solar influence at the low energy, Energies. We have galactic cosmic rays, which is most of what we observe, and then the extragalactic and the transition between galactic and extragalactic. Still, we know above 8 EV it is extragalactic, but we don't know when it started to be extragalactic and how did the galactic component disappear. So this is still a big question, so we have an overlapping region. The way we go about it is we have space experiments that are really doing the best uh, measurements uh, for the low energy cosmic rays and then the ground experiments for the highest energy cosmic rays. So I have to mention the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, AMS, is one of these amazing achievements. Um, it was installed in the ISS in 2011. It has 100, sorry, yeah, that's correct, 113 billion uh, charged particles uh, measured. And here are some examples of their um, different types of, of spectrum, and it's very interesting to see uh, some classes. So you have, you know, sort of a primary cosmic rays, secondary cosmic rays, electrons, which don't seem to fit anything, and then protons, antiprotons, and positrons, which seem to do something similar, although there were some debate about this, but they look quite, uh, so there are four different classes of power laws that we are looking at in rigidity. So that's an interesting uh, question. It's not what uh, the sort of standard model for cosmic ray propagation would have predicted, so we have a lot of fun at low energy cosmic rays trying to figure that out also. We have more company to AMS now in the ISS. We have Colette and Ice Cream, ISS Cream. They uh, are now taking data, and th this whole field is really blossoming in terms of the amount of data and trying to understand the low energy cosmic ray range. What I've been working on uh, with a few uh, friends uh, at APC here is trying to use uh, the extreme energy range uh, it's try and try to open a new window which is observe them from space. And the basic idea is that uh, the way to increase our exposure is to go to space and look at the whole atmosphere at once. Because our main challenge is the flux, right? So the flux at the knee is one per meter square per year. When you get to the very highest energies is one per kilometer or less than one per kilometer square per century. So we need tons of kilometer squares or cube of atmosphere. And the way we um, do this is, you know, fortunately there is an extensive air shower produced by these particles and they can fluoresce, for example, and you can observe them from very far away. If you happen to be right below it, you can also get the shrink of uh, emission from it. So those techniques uh, allow us to be able to observe a huge volume of the atmosphere by uh, placing detectors in space. So, uh, but until now, all the data is done on the ground, and the leading observatories are the telescope array, which is a 700 kilometer square array um, in Utah with three fluorescent telescopes, and the Pierre Roger Observatory, which is 3,000 square kilometers of uh, uh, an array of detectors in four fluorescence telescopes. Uh, the Pierre Roger Observatory was very much involved um, in the beginning of APC, so uh, Jim Cronin visited many times and he had the best time uh, talking to Pierre and all the, and getting the group here uh, that Etienne back there uh, is uh, the leader of, uh, involved in the Pierre Roger Observatory in the early days and now uh, uh, Etienne and the group are also working on the space uh, option. Um, so here's uh, Jim who passed away uh, 
think seven, eight months before uh, Pierre. Uh, he would have been uh, very sad to see Pierre go, but you know, I guess there are some pluses of going early. I guess that was a very grim comment, but anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, we had a great time uh, being at uh, APC and getting uh, some of the uh, OG uh, done. It was quite an ambitious project, and it uh, did a beautiful job. Here is one of its beautiful uh, spectral um, productions of with 300,000 events and an exposure of uh, 670,000 kilometers square to radian year, you can have a beautiful um, measurement of the cosmic ray flux from seven, uh, 10 to the 17 and a half all the way to 10 to the 20. Uh, and the, uh, the telescope array has a different energy scale of about 10%, but the two data are pretty much consistent given their uh, systematics. So, you know, we have a really good agreement on the spectrum, on the ankle, and then at the turnaround there might be interesting things happening, but it's not quite there. Uh, one news from the uh, 2010s is that we were assuming we would see su tur such turnaround due to what's called the GZK effect, but now we are confused given the, the, the fact that the composition is not pure protons, it very much uh, a possibility that the maximum energy of the accelerator is what's driving the turnaround and not the GZK effect. Uh, unfortunately, the statistics is very limited there, which is why the drive to build something bigger that can see um, much more events at the highest energies. So here's what the GZK effect is. It's just the proton uh, producing pions on the microwave background. Uh, this was suggested by Grazin, Zeppelin, and Kuzmin just after the microwave background was discovered, and this is just a recent, more recent uh, proton energy loss length. But basically, you have a wall around 10 to the 19 electron volts that comes down. Um, this uh, interaction also produces photons and neutrinos, and this is uh, the cosmogenic neutrino flux, which uh, would peak around EEVs or between, um, you know, yeah, just below an EEV level. It ranges from, from model to model. Let me show you. Uh, so from the proton point of view, this is very straightforward. When you start putting in the nuclei, the energy loss length gets much more complicated, and the cosmogenic neutrino gives you a much bigger range. So from a proton model to an iron model, you have a big range. And this whole work was done here in APC2, some of it in Chicago in the beginning and then moved on to APC when APC was um, you know, built uh, the group. So this is one of the main contributions also to the ultra energy cosmic rays from uh, Pierre's vision was to include the whole idea that nuclei might be there and turns out the data says they are there. So the, the data is from Auger uh, mainly and it's uh, showing protons and iron changing from uh, the composition from lower um, energies, which is a little bit heavier towards protons and turn around. This is done two ways. It's done with the fluorescence telescopes by looking at both the shower maximum and the fluctuations about the mean, but also in the ground you can do an extrapolation to X max and, and sort of extend it to higher energies, which is what OJ prime is going to do even better. So here is what both the mean uh, shower maximum for these extensive air showers looks like as a function of energy and the variation about the mean, how it sort of goes from protons, which are in red here, towards iron. And this is a decomposition as a function of energy. Uh, this is 10 to the 19, it's hard to read, uh, but you basically see proton dominance uh, passing the ball to helium and then passing the ball to CNO, but then we run out of statistics, so we don't know what happens here, which would be very important to understand the difference, as I mentioned, between the maximum energy and the GZK. So these are different ways to plot the same, uh, so different models that you can explain the same spectrum that will change quite a bit if the assumption is that this uh, turnaround is due to the maximum, of the, ener the maximum energy of the accelerator versus the GZK effect. The fact that you have nuclei uh, gives you a lot more uh, freedom to accelerate pr uh, the nuclei in, in comparison to protons in terms of the sort of maximum energy requirements of the Hillis plot. So having a larger Z makes it a little bit easier. So it gives a little bigger range for these sort of extreme models. It's very hard basically to accelerate to 10 to the 20 a proton. And so if we're seeing Emax, it's not a complete surprise, but you know, it's still a bit uh, harder for us to, to digest it. That was definitely not the prejudice when we got started. And just for reference, this is the LHC. This is magnetic fields versus sizes. And these are the possible um, 
sort of usually discuss models if, if, ranging from neutron stars at the low end to IGN shocks, but you know most likely the, the biggest efforts are really on AGN jets and gamma ray bursts as the two uh, culprits of these um, ultra energy cosmic rays. But we don't know yet what really is driving it. So. Anisotropies is really exciting, uh, especially when you get above three sigma. So I mentioned already the dipole, which is the one uh, above three sigma, well, above uh, five sigma event that we have or measurement that we have, which is uh, wonderful news that we we sort of uh, expected it to, you know, not be towards the galactic plane, but that it actually is uh, doing uh, sort of an interesting direction compared to the large scale structure is, is sort of comforting. Uh, we do have uh, three sigma type fluctuations that might tell you something about a source, maybe not, that doesn't seem to be becoming more significant with time. This is from the Northern Hemisphere and the telescope array data. And Auger in the south again, we have four sigma result, which is in the intermediate scales above 39 EV, we get four sigma correlations with starburst galaxies and a smaller correlation with AGN. So, <coughs> excuse me. So this is starting to become interesting, but not quite at the five sigma level. So just to summarize, the dipole starts at eight EV, and the sources start at forty-ish EV or fifty EV. So the source hotspots are starting to become interesting here. So we expect to do particle astronomy at the very highest energies when we run out of data, uh, but we know that they are extragalactic much earlier. So that's the situation there. But it would be really wonderful to see uh, from the same direction of uh, a hotspot, for example, uh, either gamma rays or. Um, neutrinos that are produced by the propagation. So, so far we have seen no uh, photons and that is highly dependent on, for example, the radio background. So it's one, something that you know, photons might not be able to make it here, which is why neutrinos and Francis already mentioned are the one uh, sort of sure shot. And again, an APC uh, inspired uh, work, which then has moved on from postdocs to postdocs and to students uh, who are now professors. Uh, for example, something that Kumiko and I did based on what we had done before with uh, Dini Allard, uh, was uh, to just give a range of what the cosmogenic neutrinos seem to look like. And this is a very large range. It actually has become even larger as we go down with, you know, for example, iron rich uh, options. Um, and with the current OG data. But then you have the, uh, the searches for these high energy neutrinos here, the ice cube neutrinos, which are found, and then limits, uh, and they're very far from the gray area, which is sort of a reasonable uh, range, maybe a bit op optimistic, and then even further from the really bottom of this story. So the connection between astrophysical and cosmogenic neutrinos at the edge here, uh, after Ice Cube has found the astrophysical, would be very nice to see the cosmogenic, and that would really help us figure out the, the sources of ultra-energy cosmic rays. So we already heard about the beautiful results from Ice Cube, I don't think you actually showed this plot, but this is a beautiful plot showing what's going on in the sky. Uh, he did show this plot, which uh, I wanted to emphasize the amazing luck. Sorry, uh, this is for me to speed up a little. Uh, anyway, the amazing luck uh, of the OG uh, Earth skimming range. And the reason I want to highlight this, so this is where the gravitational wave was detected and OG was right on top of it. And OG is doing that by looking at the limb of the Earth. And it moves with the Earth, so it happened to be at the right time within 500 seconds. And uh, that's exactly the type of measurements that we want to do in the future for the very high energy uh, neutrinos because they don't come through the whole Earth like the lower energy ones do. Uh, and so one, some of the models that have tried to unify everything we know, grand unified models of ultra energy cosmic rays and neutrinos, they try to uh, explain both the neutrinos, the cosmic rays, and be below the photons uh, limits from Fermi. And so trying to explain all of the above together would be you know, really the way to go. And this is one particular model using jets and clusters. Uh, so returning to the questions of the 20s, how are we going to answer these questions? Here is a busy plot with future projects. So we have lots of ideas for the future uh, and I sort of separated them. So this is you know, a long range here. So this is the 20s and then the 30s at the edge. 
Uh, so we have right now uh, the plan to uh, upgrade OG to OG Prime and to get the telescope array to be the same size of OG because it's a quarter of the size, so it will be matching the size by a factor of four. Then there is a larger array which is uh, being discussed uh, mostly in Europe at this point. We have the high energy neutrino, uh, which is so this is divided into ultra energy uh, cosmic ray primary objectives and high energy neutrino primary objectives like Ice Cube, Antares. KM3 NAT, Ice Cube Generation 2, uh, which I'm not going to talk much about. Uh, but then we have the ultra energy neutrino primary objectives, which really might feed into the ultra energy cosmic ray question because these are the same sources are creating both. Um, and then uh, ultra energy cosmic rays and neutrinos, which is uh, where I'm really excited about, is the hybrid, the idea that you can do both uh, at a, a sort of multi messenger type uh, scheme. So, on the ultra energy cosmic ray part, which is what i um, asked to talk about, I already mentioned telescope array will be four times its size, so it will, will have equal exposure to cosmic rays in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And in the OG site, uh, there is an upgrade, which is OG Prime, and the idea here is really to extend the ability first to be able to study the hadronic interactions because we see way too many muons uh, by compared to any, uh, any hadronic interaction models, but also to extend the composition to higher energies because the ground array can do you know, 10 to 20 times more than the fluorescence can do. So if we can use the ground array data, we can get a lot more measurements there. I wanted to mention another effort that was done at APC, which was to design the Eugene North proposal had actually started in Chicago and then it ended here in APC, and we had a plan to do a seven times bigger than OG in the north. Unfortunately, that's not in the, the workings right now, not even with the telescope rate times four, so we were a bit ahead of ourselves. But uh, we did get great reviews. We were uh, rated in the, the Cato survey third after Hawk CTA. So imagine CTA hasn't happened yet, so we were going to be next after CTA. So in the meantime, we have moved on to different ideas. One of them is this uh, Global Cosmic Ray Observatory that the Helm Helmholtz Large Infrastructure Roadmap is, is looking into starting in 20, I mean, this was discussed in 2015, uh, and it would be many sites doing OG type detectors, but much bigger. Um, and then the things that I'm most excited about, and I'll start with GRAND. GRAND is definitely GRAND. It is the giant radio array for neutrino detection. And I think Olivier is back there. Kumiko had to leave because, you know, some people have families and they have to go home, Stavros. <laughs> anyway, uh, so they are leading this effort uh, to put a humongous 200,000 kilometers square uh, set of uh, antennae in uh, probably China. They are starting already, uh, and this is sort of by, to look at both the uh, you know tau upgoing tau showers um, uh, in the radio detection uh, mode and cosmic rays in radio detection mode. And uh, that would be really the size that would do the trick, and I'll show you soon. They have started with a 35 uh, radio antenna and scintillators to do a standalone trigger with um, radio. And in their 20s, they will be doing 300 um, such uh, antennae, so they will be covering 300 kilometers square. And by the, the end of the decade, beginning of the next one, they will be ready to do the 200,000 antenna if everything goes according to plan, and they even give you the budget for everything, but you know, probably that will change in time. Uh, what we're doing uh, with APC uh, collaboration is to uh, move towards space probes of ultra energy cosmic rays and neutrinos, and it's a combined project. It sort of grew out of the USO uh, effort, which is the Extreme Universe Space Observatory effort, which was to put a refractor in the space station, and that uh, we have not done the, the space station version of uh, the, the project, but we've done many prototypes, including balloons, a mini USO, which will be going to the inside of the ISS next year, and um, you know, telescope array on the ground. So we have uh, USO-like projects in many places, and with that, we've been learning a lot about the technology. And so the last effort uh, on this was uh, this past May, uh, past April, when we launched the USO SPB, which is the Extreme Universe Space Observatory on a super pressure balloon. And this is uh, us dressed, uh, ready to go. Uh, we had to wait a little longer, but 
uh, there are some Apese people there. Guillaume is, is one of the people that are showing their support to go fly. And this is the actual refractor ready to go. It is a ultra-fast camera. It takes pictures in the ultraviolet at night with microsecond time scales to actually observe the showers of ultra-energy cosmic rays. And this is exactly based, it's a smaller version of what the USO was designed to do. Here is the actual launch. Unfortunately, we were hoping to have a 100-day launch uh, sort of flight, and we had just uh, 12 days, which were not the best 12 days because we were uh, having leaks on the third day. So this was not uh, the kind of flight we were hoping for. But uh, even before we got launched, we already had funding for the second uh, balloon probe, which we are now uh, constructing, starting to construct. And this one is more uh, ambitious than the previous one. We have both the fluorescence from ultra energy cosmic ray technique, which was developed by uh, here in APC with a beautiful fast camera in the microsecond uh, range to look for fluorescence on the, so this is now the surface of the ocean and this is the atmosphere and we have the ultra energy cosmic ray fluorescence rays that we can observe. But we also are developing Cherenkov detectors, uh, which would be in the tens of nanoseconds time slots for the, the type of cameras. And those would be uh, basically to observe ultra energy cosmic rays from above the limb coming towards us to know exactly what the signal of a tau lepton decay would look like. So once we've studied the ultra energy cosmic ray signal that we know is there, we should be able to search for the tau lepton coming up, being produced by the tau neutrinos. So that's the way we're going to search for neutrinos, which is uh, an old idea, but we had uh, sort of proposed that it has an amazing sensitivity to the, all the cos cosmogenic uh, fluxes if we put something like that in space. And this was, again, something that um, Semikos from APC here was part of this effort, which we call CHANT, the Sharenkov from Astroph Astrophysical Neutrino Telescope. Now, the nice thing about this technique is that Sharenkov light has so much more uh, photons that we can go to lower energy. So in principle, we can actually bridge between Francis and the very high energy range in the EEV. So we can start at tens of PEV. Uh, so what we're de designing this year also for the decadal survey in the US is a probe mission. Probe uh, is code for a billion dollars or below in NASA. So probe mission means you know up to a billion dollar mission uh, to be launched within the next decade. And so we were one of the 10 probes selected to do a study. This is a conceptual study. And uh, our probe is named POEMA, which stands for Probe of Extreme Multi-Messenger Astrophysics. So this is, this is uh, the, the idea, joint idea of USO and OWL. And OWL was an earlier study in the 2002 time in which you also had this same feature, which is stereo observer observatory. So the idea is to have two observatories launched so that we can actually do a stereo vision for ultra energy cosmic rays. But we have added to it the chant idea um, and a camera which is based on Uzo, so it's a real hybrid um, product of all the different efforts in the field. And it's, uh, let me show you a little bit about it. So first, it, this is what it would look like deployed. It would be looking down. This is the spacecraft. And this is out of the design lab at the Goddard Space Flight Center that we had one week with the engineers designing the instrument and one week designing the actual uh, spacecraft. And uh, now we have, so we want to have one launch with both uh, eyes of the teles both telescopes. So we have a sort of accordion type structure that uh, sque squeezes it together so we can actually put two of them for launch uh, and those would fit into an, an Atlas V launch. And these are some of the spe uh, specifications of the mass and data and so forth. Here's what the design looks like of the instrument. So it's basically a very nice uh, lens, which is pretty interesting uh, design that we can m maximize the photons on the, uh, on, the focal sur on the mirror. And then the focal surface, which you can't see from this side, but you can see here, I will zoom into it. But just to show you, this is the insides of the telescope. It's very simple. And this is what it would look like uh, before launch. So before launch, and then it would be deployed. Now, the focal surface is the most exciting part. It has the multi-messenger bit in it. It's a hybrid. It has the fluorescence telescope a style detector, which is built at an APC here. We call it a PDM, photo detector module, which is uh, made of multi anode PMTs. And uh, this is what we've been building for all these different prototypes. And this is a new vo novel uh, d design, which we will be flying for the first time in USO SPB2, uh, based on silicon PMs. And this would be the Sharenkov part. And it's designed so that it could observe the limb of the Earth. So we would see the neutrinos in this range, and we would see the cosmic rays in general uh, in the blue range. So that's our plan 
for the future, and both Grant and Poema will increase, uh, and this is all uh, a little bit fuzzy because we haven't finished all the design specifications, at least for Poema and the actual prediction, but the range would be of about an order of magnitude increase in exposure to ultra energy cosmic rays. And then we also have, let me skip this part, uh, the uh, impact on this plot, but let me, sh in, before I show the impact of both Grand and Poema on the cosmogenic neutrinos, let me add a huge effort on cosmogenic neutrinos is going on, including ANITA, ARA, ARIANA, um, both, all of them in the Antarctic uh, continent. Uh, ANITA actually has done what I was dreaming we would do one day, but we, nobody believes it, but one day, <laughs> if we believe it, that would be wonderful. Uh, neutrinos at EV range are supposed to come, if you look at this plot, uh, f at most, uh, you know, three degrees, maybe 10 degrees, but they see something coming from minus 30 degrees, so this is pretty funny that um, my dream comes true and maybe it's just background. But that's exactly the kind of science one could do if we have lots of neutrinos and we understand how they interact on Earth. We can, in principle, see them deviate from any of our extrapolations. Or maybe those are not neutrinos. Some people say this is dark matter decay. But anyway, this is uh, one of the interesting options for the future. So to conclude, uh, POEMA is uh, one of the big efforts that would also help and grant on this uh, largest scale. Uh, POEMA, in terms of looking for ultra energy cosmic rays, could focus down and it would be the size of sort of Michigan and the lake. While if it's actually being used in the looking at the limb part, it would be uh, as if you're looking from one side of the continent of the US to the other. So that's uh, pretty big. Uh, and we have to use all that volume. So here is the sensitivity of Poema uh, in dashed lines, really preliminary. We are still finishing the design, but by the end of the year, we should have this become a solid line, and we'll tell you what it is. And then Grant it, uh, starts at a little higher energy, oops, and then they have a really good uh, bite out of this uh, prediction zone. So those are the two sort of forward-looking in the far future to reach uh, those energies. It's very possible that... Um, Poema and Grand will see before the GZK type neutrinos, the cosmogenic type neutrinos, uh, the sources themselves. So the sources we know, Ice Cube has seen them, but maybe the ultra energy cosmic ray sources have a shape that come out depending on the type that you choose, the type of model, they might be actually easier to detect than the, pr the propagation neutrinos. So this is uh, what, uh, you know, a list of possible uh, future ways. So I think as far as predicting the future, we have lots of ideas and lots of um, drive, um, hopefully also optimism, just like um, our friend uh, Pierre. So uh, just to conclude, uh, Pierre uh, has inspired many of us, and I think the list of names here are people that have connected to, uh, you know, University of Chicago, being a student there or being here or working with uh, in collaboration. I think the list is much longer. This is what I was trying to do before uh, the break. And uh, But anyway, this is some of the pictures of the folks that have been influenced by the fact that uh, Pierre had that drive. Uh, and I wanted to close by uh, just repeating his sentence that the comforting thought, the comforting thought is that uh, it can only get better. So hopefully it will get a lot better. Thanks. Uh, I've been asked to uh, sort of uh, mention a, a little bit the uh, future of the synergy uh, between geosciences and, uh, and, and astroparticles. In fact, uh, I want to broaden a little bit the scope of this to a vision of, of Pierre uh, towards interdisciplinarity. Uh, I was struck today uh, and yesterday about the many uh, scientific lives uh, he had. We've, we've learned uh, many things that he has done a long time ago. And there's, there's much more, actually, to say, so we, 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 we would need more days. Uh, I will try to, to focus, though, on the geosciences and, uh, and astroparticle physics. But it's important to, to say that these were really uh, fruits. These are fruits of the seeds that he planted. Uh, and, and he was really a visionary man for that uh, in many of these aspects. So this is a complex diagram. He, 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 he loved very much diagrams, as I will uh, show you later. And I will start with, uh, with this component that uh, relates to the LabEx universe, that is this laboratory of excellence that bridges uh, other laboratories uh, in, in the regions. I will mention that uh, in particular. But the rest I will mention uh, also, but uh, uh, shortly, is actually uh, now making a kind of a, a virtuous circle 
into the different domains, space science, earth science, and, and society. So all this is now very much linked, and this is the success of the vision uh, that he had. So it's uh, obviously very natural that uh, uh, this, uh, these days are advertised on the website of the universe uh, uh, LabEx. And if we are back in the uh, uh, first days of the LabEx, the proposals came, uh, okay, so as, as Pierre, with one of the, of the founding fathers, uh, in, in 2011. And so you see the, the scheme, uh, uh, which uh, looks now a little bit old-fashioned with respect to the new one of the logo of the universe, and that you see that uh, we find the, the scientific committee of this first uh, attempt to get this uh, universe uh, uh, laboratory uh, under the chair of, uh, of George Smoot, who, who took part of it since the very beginning and still uh, uh, is there. And so uh, um, Pierre had this vision and, and these proposals to try to bridge the different uh, scientific schemes. So this is the old scheme of the LabEx universe. Uh, the new one is actually pretty similar. Uh, in blue, essentially, you see the places, uh, it, you can hardly read, but you see the places where you have the interfaces uh, being them of, of anal analysis or instrumentation in different uh, aspects. Uh, as of today, this has not changed uh, so far, and I will go through some of the highlight projects uh, of, of these uh, interfaces. Uh, so the, the Universe LabEx as of today, uh, had, uh, so this has been successfully financed with a, a, budget, a total budget of order of, of 9 million euros, and uh, until uh, the period that is coming, so we're coming to an end, and we want ob uh, obviously to, to renew this. So this is uh, federating three laboratories, uh, APC, of course, uh, the Institut Physique du Globe, and uh, Astrophysique des Interactions multi HM, IEM, and also ONERA is participating. So, so far, this has, has led to 20 projects uh, of different types. Uh, the Frontier is projects that are only uh, related to uh, uh, team, teams of a specific labs, but the interdisciplinary uh, ones are the interface and the exploratory. And of course, some of the first exploratory um, uh, projects had become interface projects and, and they, they get to maturity. Of course, this is also related very much to, um, to uh, education. I don't know if this works. Yeah, to education and valorization. So altogether, this has uh, 200 uh, uh, full-time equivalent uh, and, and this had uh, 30 uh, postdocs and, and the, 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 the same amount of PhDs. So this is a quite ambitious uh, uh, framework and these are the many projects. And so the, the one with the, the, the red square are the ones that I'm going to try to highlight a little bit because those are really at the interface between geosciences and astroparticle physics. So the first focus that I would like to, um, to mention is the one that I called uh, geophysics and gravitational wave interferometric detectors. So the experts are in the room in case you have questions, but I think this one is really one of the highlights of the LabEx with the mission to explore the synergies between geophysics and gravitational wave detectors. And so, of course, this goes in two ways. The first challenge is how geophysics experience and instrumentation can contribute to uh, gravitational wave science and how gravitational wave experience and instrumentation can contribute to geosciences and to geophysical applications. And uh, there are, these are uh, two main aspects here. The first question is, can we detect the gravity perturbation due to an earthquake before the arrival of seismic waves? So you obviously uh, um, immediately understand the impact on society that this could have because uh, we want to build up early warning systems, right? And so the second question is then, can we use these gravity perturbations to improve the current earthquake early warning system, as I just said? So the benefits are obvious. Uh, of these early warning systems, uh, you can control the trains, uh, stop, uh, try to stop things that would put uh, uh, dangers. Uh, you can permit individual protections. You can alert the schools. And so, again, I, I wanted to stress not only the fact that this is synergies in science, but this is synergies towards society that we are uh, developing doing so. So, um, the focus here is that there are new directions in seismology using gravity detectors, so what we call strain meters, and uh, this, of course, uh, is international cooperation. So 
as you know, when there is a fault rupture, uh, so you have a displacement of huge, huge, uh, ma huge masses, and you can see those with uh, uh, seismometers. And the seismometers would detect the seismic waves, and those would travel with a few kilometers per second. Right? But gravity instead traveled with the speed of light. And so the challenge here is, is obvious. If you can detect the, the change in the gravity field, then you can provide these alerts um, uh, much more fastly. And so you can increase uh, available time for warning, reduce also some kind of blind zone, and, and you can also, as I will try to advocate, make a quicker estimate of the magnitude of the earthquake uh, itself. So clearly these are very strong links between the, the interferometers community and the geoscience community. So uh, an example that is given here is actually a, a first uh, act which is the, the gravity signal from the Tokohoku Oki earthquake that happened in 2011. And so this first act is that this, with a set of uh, superconducting uh, gravimeters and broadband uh, seismometers that, that are uh, indicated here, uh, with a set of those uh, instruments, this has been possible to actually detect the gravity uh, um, perturbation from this, um, from this earthquake, looking back into the data. And so this was a, a, a nature communication paper. And then the second step, so this was a very huge uh, uh, earthquake, of course, of magnitude 9. The second step is that um, actually uh, the same people made more calculations, modeling, and they have been uh, able not only uh, to, 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 to make these detections, but also to some kind of, of make a predictions of what they had to, to see. And so uh, they, they, these earthquakes, uh, they generate, you know, these large motions. And it is said that unlike the elastic wave uh, that propagates from the Earth, the gravity perturbations travels at the speed of light. And so the signal would have allowed an accurate magnitude estimates in a minute. And this is what is shown here. I mentioned about the time scale, but the magnitude is something even more challenging. And so what you see on these plots are the different response of the instruments at different distances. And this is, th this is the time that goes there. And so red is the data from the observations and uh, the black is the simulation, right? Um, uh, from the Tokoku uh, uh, earthquake. And this would be simulation with an earthquake of a magnitude 8.5. So as you see, uh, you see deviations from the, um, fr from the different magnitude test of order that's very small, of order of one nanometer per square second. And so this is exactly what they, they show here, is that they could predict displa displacements. And so uh, after a few uh, a minutes time scale, they would be able to, to, to provide with an alert. So this would have dramatic impact uh, on society, of course, and this is under development. I really think this is a highlight of the, of the results of the LabEx. Uh, there are more synergies into these directions uh, as you want to make um, better seismometers. And so one line of search is to have interferometric readouts of seismometers. So this is just uh, to flash the result here that uh, this is some kind of R&D on the readout systems of these uh, detectors. So this is a few centimeter detector and this is the first measurement in the lab uh, through uh, an interferometric readout, which is different from the, the, the capacitor readouts that is usually used for those seismometers. And so if you start thinking of improved seismometers, then uh, you can dream of detecting uh, uh, important things, like uh, it has been proposed to detect gravitational waves uh, uh, with the moon, for instance, as the modes could be excited from these gravitational waves. Of course, this is challenging and this requires upgraded detectors, but, but this is relevant today, first of all, in the context of the launch that I think is tomorrow, if I'm not wrong, of uh, the InSight mission, where they want to place, you know, they want to go to Mars and there there will be a seismometer. So this is kind of a classical one, but already this can study, uh, 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 well, not earthquake, but planet quake, uh, uh, Mars quakes uh, first. And then if you, if, if you have a success there, and then you can dream of having a set of instruments either on the moon or on, on, on other planets. And some people advocate that you could detect the, the gravitational wave uh, like this. So this is clearly uh, something very important that is for the future and that we will continue to work on. Still, uh, but changing a little bit the subject, with the synergy of geosciences and, um, and astroparticle physics, we have the geoneutrinos that have been uh, detected 
uh, by the Borexino experiment, not only, but here I'm, I'm citing Borexino because the PC participated to this uh, experiment. So you can see on those plots the, the different um, components that have been uh, uh, observed. And so this is uh, obviously an important synergy as well because here you're probing uh, to some extent the content uh, inside the Earth. Um, of, the, uh, of its, the, its structure, and in particular, the uh, composition, the, the sorry, the fraction of uh, uranium and, and thorium. So today, the, the, the data are not very much uh, uh, constraining the models. This would be, for instance, kind of a, a regular model, and uh, this would be the contour one sigma, two sigma, three sigma of the current data. But if you go to the next generation uh, detector of that kind, uh, the kind of Borexino, namely Juno, then you can hope to start disentangling between different uh, models of these uh, compositions of the ratio between uh, uranium and thorium. So this is also a very synergetic line of work that we will continue in the future. Another one that also makes the bridge between geoscience and astroparticle physics is essentially to use the kind of detector Francis mentioned about. So as he said, we want to build up neutrino telescope in the Mediterranean. So you, we melt ice cube in the Mediterranean Sea and we want to have two of these detectors, uh, one for the astrophysics and one that is going to study the atmospheric neutrinos uh, because we want to measure the uh, mass hierarchy of those neutrinos. So this is for the astroparticle physics. But if you Imagine that uh, you're going to make a, a study of the atmospheric neutrinos that are passing through the Earth, then they can bring an additional information of, about the composition of the Earth. So we want to use the next generation neutrino telescope, namely KM3Net, in its uh, dense configurations that we call ORCA, and that is going to be built uh, off Toulon at 40 kilometers, uh, close by the site of Antares, to investigate the, uh, the composition of the Earth in a very independent way that is usually done in geosciences, right? Because there are no, there's no such, such uh, uh, different ways to study this. And so um, if you assume that, the, um, that the, the, the density is known, then uh, the oscillation pattern will be altered by the uh, proportion of Z over A. So that is essentially the composition. And so uh, you can try to, uh, to, to infer a measurement or to, to test the composition of the core and the mantle. And so these are preliminary results that we've achieved with, with the detector ORCA that is planned. But ORCA is certainly not optimized for that, right? It, it's optimized for another physics. But still, what it says here is that uh, you can probe at the level of order of a uh, three sigma or less than this, well, I should say that the standards are not the same for high energy physics and for geosciences in terms of the standard deviations that you're aiming for. So this is good enough in, in certain uh, conditions. So you can probe uh, the deviation from 0.5 uh, in certain models. And in particular, if there are additional hydrogens uh, components, uh, this would be of interest. So this is a line of work that is also being uh, conducted. Uh, of course, with that kind of detector, you can go beyond geosciences and uh, astroparticle, you can go to Earth, of course, uh, and sea sciences, because you can take advantages of those cable observatories that provide information in real time with a high power, a high bandwidth, this low fre high frequency. You have multiple sensors that can be triggered and trigger each other so that you, you make not multi-messenger, uh, also you make multi-messenger in the deep sea, but the, the, this, this is different type of messengers. So this is a continuous data rate. Uh, you can do this for a very long term. So these interdisciplinary activities have been supported by the LabEx as well and by uh, other, uh, uh, of course, uh, partners. Then I would like to mention also the efforts that are uh, currently being done into uh, using particles for geosciences, again, not through neutrinos this time, but through muons. And so this is the, the, the known muon tomography. The idea is that you use the muon flux of atmospheric muon flux, and the, you, you see the, 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 the flux with your detector, how it has been absorbed. And this, if you reconstruct uh, the number of particles, this can infer information uh, in a 3D, if you turn around it, about uh, potential cavities. And uh, you know these famous results that came in November 2017 about the discovery of a big hole inside um, the, the, the pyramid in Egypt. So this was, we were not part of this, uh, of this specific uh, measurement. Sakley was, not the LabEx, but, but of course the same people uh, contributed. And, and we're pursuing these efforts. Uh, in Greece, where we want to do myography with archaeological structures. And so this is a bit more challenging because um, 
potentially you will have a smaller cavities to probe. Also, um, uh, you have to put your detector in such a way that they would see inclined muons. And so the rate is reduced uh, because it goes with cosine square. And therefore, you need to have longer uh, term uh, measurements. But still, uh, this is almost in place. The first shift is going to, to take um, to start in summer, and this was Stavros' idea um, to bring the detector into this horse cam, cam to move it to the place. So this is going to be installed. All those activities are promoted uh, at different levels in terms of communications, but um, but also at the level of, of schools for, for students and, and doctorates. And so universe participated, organized three full schools uh, that uh, you can see here with uh, uh, an important number of participants. And so each time we, we were really trying to target the synergy between geosciences and astroparticle physics. I mean, this was a success and this success nowadays, as you well know, go beyond uh, the LabX universe. For instance, here I show you to ISAP school, so ISAP is an international uh, um, uh, institute for, for uh, doctorate schools. And so they bring together all the community in astroparticle physics. And so the first one that, was, that took place was in 2016, and it had quite a, quite a success. And therefore, we're organizing now the second school of that kind, where we want to use particles to probe the, the Earth's uh, properties. So this, you can still register, I think, uh, is going to be organized in July. So as you see, this, this is quite, uh, quite interesting and, um, and, and okay, th there were many ideas uh, due to the, to the success of, of these synergies that Pierre had in mind. And at some point, he, he, he was so enthusiastic about all these things that he, he, he himself supported an idea to make a department bridging the physics in general or astro astrophysics with, a, with a Earth. And so Earth and Universe Sciences. So this idea of merging the two departments did not come out. I mean, you know, you cannot be a visionary without having a little bit of protest in front of you. So this, this was not uh, such an easy uh, thing to do. I remember this moment because he organized the Assemblée Générale of the laboratory. And so I took myself this picture because, as I told you, Pierre, I liked very much to do schemes and try to, to, to draw the synergy between those. Uh, it was not fully clear. I'm not, I, I don't know who's this person. I can't rem uh, recognize here, right? But it seems that it was a hard uh, job to, to pursue the people, though. So you always have to fight uh, firmly. But these were seeds uh, for different actions. And in particular, the one that I want to, to cite here is the merging of the two doctoral schools uh, um, that uh, actually happened into the doctoral school that is now uh, uh, named Science de la Terre et de l'Environnement. A physique de l'univers de Paris. So this is the Steppel Doctoral School. That is again the fruit of uh, of, of this uh, synergy. So the future for this probably uh, could be a graduate school. And so we have uh, uh, a few months ago started to have a graduate school, which would include the uh, the uh, formation with a master uh, into the into the labex. Um, this, this does not pass the, the threshold, but will be uh, resubmitted uh, most likely last year. And so this is certainly a line of work for the, for the future as, as well. So let's continue to get a, a, a glance on the future. As I told you, uh, Universe uh, had a very positive evaluation recently. And so uh, these are, we have established these strong links between the geophysics and astrophysics community. And this is Towards Society. So this has been recognized as a uniqueness partnership in France and abroad. And what we want to do, of course, is to enlarge this. And so uh, one of, of the ideas is actually at the level of APEC uh, to meet with the same kind of community. So this is the GEO8 European Network for Earth Sciences to, to make a, a meeting that is going to be organized with the help of Stavros so that we enlarge the scope of our activities in universe to a, a, a another scale, right? And of course, we want to renew universe. So this is going to be universe plus. So I'm not going to spend uh, as much time on the different uh, diagrams uh, as the one I, I just spent right now. Uh, we've spoke about the MOOC uh, gravity and the impact that it had on, the, on society. We didn't speak so much about one of the aspects that I would like to, to mention here. That was the synergy. This was also an idea from, from, from Pierre. This was mentioned earlier today uh, to have a, a, a data center 
located close by uh, uh, APC. And so this idea came into the context of uh, the Campus Spatial of Paris Diderot, which was an action pluridisciplinaire, so again, a, a multidisciplinary activity that started at the same moment, essentially, to bring together the different people that want to work on, on science, uh, uh, in space sciences and astroparticle physics in general. So in this context, um, uh, Pierre uh, also launched uh, um, the idea of a data center. Before I, I come to this, um, I, I should say, because I think this is pretty important, that one action that was supported by the uh, Campus uh, Spatial and also by the LabEx uh, towards the, the younger people is the uh, launch of a, a nanosatellite. So this here is the uh, ionospheric and gamma ray observation satellite, uh, EGOSAT, that is a project that is being developed, and I, I don't want to be too long on this, but this, this is... Uh, almost ready to be launched, the launch in Spain in, in, in 2019. So this um, triggered many uh, activities during the, at the laboratory, but not only uh, work of students, but the, the, the numbers are impressive. We had more than 200 students that came in APC and the different laboratories to work on these uh, uh, aspects. And so I think at this stage, if you reach such a number, you also have an impact on, on society. But you want to do more than this, you want also to do uh, science. So this is something that is being pursued, as I said, in the context of a data center that is called the FACE, the Francois Arago Center, which you can see, uh, this was the idea of, of Pierre, as a, 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 a center for space missions, and in particular with the use of a concurrent design facility that is currently located uh, in the building, uh, essentially next door, next street, uh, in the Biopark building, but that is going to be moved uh, back into the uh, Condorcet building, but not only actually, it's going to be moved also uh, in part to Institut Physique du Globe. And I think that this also illustrates again the, the virtuous circle, the synergy, the benefit of this synergy with geosciences, as we are going to, to merge the computing centers of the FACE and the one of the uh, Institut Physique du Globe. So the, 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 the future of FACE, that is to some extent called DANT here, has more aspects than sim simply the synergy between geosciences and astroparticle physics. Uh, this is essentially new challenges that uh, we need to explore. And this was, uh, again, an idea of, of Pierre. And I wanted to mention it. Actually, I I'm using here the, the words of Pierre. Uh, I took this slide uh, from one of his presentations of the laboratory. And you see, he used these uh, words in, in French, uh, les petits de l'APC, which I translated by uh, APC's baby, I'm not sure exactly how I should translate that, but I think to some extent, uh, yes, it, it is the meaning. And I think this, this Pierre had, had really those, uh, you know, those, those several um, projects uh, at heart. And I think this is what reflects uh, the, the wordings that uh, he has uh, chosen. So other babies from, from, from APC or from Pierre, they have been mentioned already uh, uh, yesterday uh, by um, by Geraldine, so uh, she, she showed this picture. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, uh, promotion uh, uh, of the CPM master in, in 97, 98. So I happen to be uh, indeed on this picture as well. You can see the blonde guy here is me and Geraldine is seated here. There are many other people that you may actually recognize on the picture. Uh, Thomas Ergeras, who is not in the room, but uh, he's hidden a little bit here. So, uh, and of course, Pierre is there. So he was the, the responsible uh, of this uh, master together with uh, Yves Charon. And so this was their first year, it has been mentioned. Uh, before that, Luc Valentin was the responsible of the, of the master. So it was a kind of a transition and both Yves and Pierre were, were very much attached to have a smooth transition. And so uh, more than this, they decided to organize a trip at the end of the year uh, to, to, you know, to, to, to bring everyone together two days uh, um, uh, at the sea. And so we went to the Lille d'Oléron uh, at the end of the, of the trip. And of course, what happened had to happen is that uh, we all decided that we would put Yves and Pierre in the sea and push them, but it was pretty cold. And so actually Pierre was not happy at all about this. It doesn't seem like this on the, on the, on the picture. You can hardly see that it's actually a bit wet, but not fully wet. And I think this is the reason why he's smiling, because Eve is completely wet, he was fully uh, into the sea. So I think uh, he escaped that uh, more th than, than the other. But okay, and this is not a cell phone. You can be reassured that there was no cell phone at this time. Anyway, so I, I'm going to conclude uh, uh, right now, again with uh, Pierre's uh, words. 
uh, I, I found um, the last email that uh, he has sent to the APC members. I think this is the last email that he has sent to the APC numbers, members. This was a bit uh, unexpected, actually. Uh, it was about a summer school. Uh, so there was a summer school that, that was advertised by Stavros. Uh, Stavros sent an email to the, to the laboratory. Uh, the summer school was l'école d'été uh, d'Alpac. And so uh, if you allow me, I will, I will try to read this uh, in French. Um, Pierre said, uh, si je peux uh, ajouter un commentaire, j'ai participé à une de ces écoles en tant qu'enseignant. Je peux témoigner que c'est un cadre exceptionnel pour comprendre ce qu'est un, une mission spatiale auprès des meilleurs spécialistes de l'ESA et du domaine. Il règne une ambiance de premier ordre, en particulier grâce aux travaux en équipe qu'il met en avant. Et vous avez toutes les chances de faire connaissance avec ceux de votre génération qui animeront les missions de demain. On m'a demandé de parler du futur. Et puis il ajoute cette phrase que je ne souhaite pas interpréter parce qu'il avait un tempérament très discret comme vous le savez mais qui, moi, m'a beaucoup marqué, euh, je le savais à ce moment-là, euh, très malade. En plus, Albach est un super village du Tyrol, et euh, l'hôtel est à 50 mètres de la tombe de Schrödinger. Vous aurez tout le loisir de vous demander s'il est vivant ou s'il est mort. Je vous remercie. <rire>